Well, folks, welcome to one more edition of Politics and Random. Egberto is your host. Thank you so kind of being part of the show. We're going to have a great show for you today. Welcome aboard, Lee Grant. Bridge MCP, we missed you yesterday. I called you out at the end. Where were you? We can't have it without you, my dear, beautiful lady. Anyhow, we also have, we also have, para ver, para ver, para ver, para ver, para ver, para ver. Uh, Julie Henderson is in the house, is in the house, is in the house. Uh, we also have, let's see, para ver, let me, let me answer a text that I think, uh, there we go, central. All right. Uh, Bridge MCP is in the house. Lee Grant is in the house. Julie Henderson is in the house. Melanie Keelan from Barcelona, Spain is in the house. Paul Fleming from Atlanta, Georgia is in the house. Tom C. from Donde Esta in Michigan is in the house. Bruce Pollard. Blood pressure is here. Bruce Pollard, what initials you've got, buddy? Blood pressure. Bruce Pollard. And we also have in the house with us, in the house with us is uh, Parve Nanette. Bird Smith, Nanette, I haven't heard you. I've seen you here and there, but you kind of, you know, I got to, when I, I have to see your name so that I can actually bingo, get, get, get you called out. And of course, we have the venerable Michael Rudden and AVQ. How are you guys doing today? Did I miss anybody? Did I miss anybody? Eric Hayes is also here. I don't like to miss all my beautiful peeps. All right. Uh, COVID positive, not feeling well. Sorry to hear. Um, I think this is the first time you got it, if I can correct. Uh, if given that you had the vaccine, uh, my experience was with my vaccine and my boosters, it was bad for one day, meaning a lot of aches and pains and fever. I still did the show, so it didn't knock me out like it knocks out some. But some people, it hits very hard that very first day, that very first complete day of incubation. I really hope I don't have to get up, you know. Well, you know, I hope you don't have to get up either. How is mommy doing? That's the other question because mommy didn't have the vaccine because of health issues. So please give us an update as far as your mother is concerned, Michael Rudnan. We'd like to hear that information as well. Uh, Fortune, from Fortune, Michael Rudnan, he's still doing his work, even as he's sick. Overemployment is here. Nearly half of workers have more than one full-time job. Monster survey, four in five workers who said they have or want to have numerous full-time jobs aren't doing it for the love of the game. In fact, it's an extra, extremely risky undertaking as they could potentially be fired by both companies if they catch wind of their plan. Rather, they told Monster they're doubling up only because their main job isn't providing enough money to make ends meet. Additionally, almost half said they're worried their current job will lay them off and they're seeking another as backup plan. That's probably a reaction to the current state of the economy, which has been gripped by inflation, a looming recession, and layoff fears. Despite the fact that layoff rates are currently below pre-pandemic norms, working two full-time jobs is, is never advisable, monster career expert Vicky Salome uh, tells uh, Fortune. It makes workers likely to burn out quickly and leaves vanishingly few hours for personal life. Plus, burnout workers are much less likely to perform well, which could put them at risk of losing both income streams altogether. This blows my mind just how broken our system is. Our people are struggling. We need higher wages. We need health care. We need paid vacation time. We need affordable housing. We need more unions and populist economic policy to facilitate all of that. Michael Rodnan. You have, this, you have described what we constantly talk about here at Politics Done Right, known as what? Antiseptic slavery. They're working two jobs not because they want to splurge. They're working two jobs because one job just ain't cutting it. They're working two jobs because with inflation, in, in, and inflation has been low for a while, but things have still been increasing in costs. There are some other factors involved, but it's all corporate greed. It is all caused by corporate greed. It is all caused by the inhumanity of our economic system. And it is something that we have the ability to do something about. Productivity extremely high in this country. Efficiency is extremely high in this country. But the, disp- the, dis- the, the way the money is dispersed... The way the plutocracy, the rich, the wealthy, 
continues to use your body, your intellect, your soul, your labor to make profits for the few, to live the lavish lifestyles that they have at your expense. And then they have those of us. They make, they give the impression that if you just work as hard as we are at the top working, that you can get there too. So we have the ill-informed supporting the policies that support these charlatans that really aren't working hard because their work is dependent on you. It is dependent on you holding one or two or three jobs because they're going to pay you substandard wages. They're going to pay you whatever the market will bear. And if there's collusion among the wealthy, whatever the market will bear, will bear just what collusion creates. Make no mistake. Make absolutely no mistake. This is all by design. Thank you very much for that piece that you just brought out there, Brother Rodney. I appreciate that. Tom C. says it's a great dismal day in Michigan here for sunshine from the PDR Posse. And the PDR Posse will oblige and provide El Señor Tom C. with some sunshine. Just thank you for being here. Thank everybody for being here. Uh, Lee Grant, how you doing, my brother? Uh, let's see what else we got here. Every case is Egberto. Here is where the government got it right, still using something into the 2050 time, great engineering, and use thus not wasting money. The B-52 was designed in a hotel room over a weekend in 1948, and it may still be flying 100 years later. There's nothing special about the B-52. It is just a rugged airplane that has not a whole lot of technology or features. It is just like a bike that's been invented over a hundred and change years ago. It is solid and it works. And it works for what it's meant to. But the B-52 is no, absolutely no match for a B-2, a B, uh, 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 the, the, the stealth or any one of these products that have particular purposes. As a workhorse that just goes in there and drop bombs, no real big technologies. It's just fine. But, there, but the B-52 doesn't stand a chance. The B-52 doesn't stand a chance in aerial warfare at all. So talking about how efficient it is now and that it's, it, it, you know, these are cheap airplanes, relatively speaking, etc. Doesn't really offer anything because the B-52 stands no chance against the planes of today. Absolutely none. The new technologies cost a lot, not because they should cost the millions that they cost, but because we have a military industrial complex who knows they can pill for us all. But the technology is good. The engineers did their jobs. The engineers did their job. The scientists did their job. They created great new airplanes that are much more, much better than the B-52, much more efficient than the B-52. They just took a, 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 a chunk of our flesh to pay for it because you know why? They could. All right, continuing. Uh, let's see. Uh, para ver, para ver, para ver. Burn, burn battery, burn from stopping production of the popular truck. Wow. What happened in the days when uh, steam engines used to blow up because they didn't have the metallurgy done correctly? Would you have said the same thing? Look, any new technology, you get into issues, right? You get into issues when these things happen. Ford stops production of electric F-150 after battery fire. Okay, so they'll figure out what happened and they'll fix it. But it's the technology of the future. You know, uh, the steam, you know the steam, the steam locomotive? You know those big boilers that, that boils the water to create the steam that run the trains that, that powered the rebuilding of America? And you know the steam Boilers that ran the factories of America? Guess what used to happen? They used to blow up. And you know why they blew up? They didn't have good pressure sensors. They didn't have uh, consistent materials that, that we knew were the same right through to prevent soft spots that created explosions. And you know what? It got better with time. That is what happens. That's how it w works. Michael, sorry. Mom's doing worse than I am. Both of us are mostly bed resting, though we're uh, helping each other out as we get 
sick at the same time. I, I hope she got the the juice in her, the um the antiviral that they have, the cocktail that they have to kind of mitigate. And what it actually does is it goes into your bloodstream and it knocks out the it knocks it actually prevents the dr- the, the 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 virus from being able to multiply much further. I hope she got the cocktail. Uh, please let us know that as well. Eric Hayes says, more people and multiple jobs to so economic policy uh, decisions and spending. I, that makes no sense, my brother, but I read it anyway. I, I read it before I thought about it. Uh, Daniel Moody made epic takedown of Nikki Haley on February 14th edition of the Mary Trump Show. Uh, thanks for pointing that out. Um, I'm going to listen to that later. Thank you for giving me that, E2247, and welcome aboard. Alistair Waters is in the house. Hi, everyone. Made it in. Thank you, Alistair, for being here. Interviewing Haley needs to cease. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you, brother. Uh, Tom C. To Eric Hayes. Michael and mom should be taking uh, Paxlovid antiviral meds ASAP. They have five days from the time they had those, those feelings of COVID. I hope they did. And if they don't, I hope somebody gets them the Paxlovid. Um, you know, when I read Facts Love It for the first, for in the beginning, I forgot what it was, but sometimes my mind gets to me. Julie Henderson says, I worked two jobs for 30 years and get seven twenty five per hour for Social Security. Not right. It's a shame. I got you, baby. I got you. But you know what? If we are successful, if Bernie is successful in the long run, in, in taxing as we should those who have benefited from our intellect, our service, and our labor, then we will be able to increase uh, the amount of Social Security that we're paying to everybody. All, and, and this isn't a gift, a giveaway, or transfer of wealth, or transfer, or what they, they like to call it um, redistribution. By definition, it is redistribution, but it is redistribution of the stolen. Anytime somebody talks to you about, we don't believe in redistribution, Say we don't, but we do believe in the redistribution of the stolen. In other words, if you earn ill advice, if you earn ill advice gained, gains, then it should be taken back in some form. And that's the method of uh, Social Security and these other features, education, etc., can be used to mitigate that all. Please remember that, folks. When you're talking these issues, don't allow conservatives to get on the moral side of the issue. The immoral side of the issue is how the wealthy got rich. The moral side of the issue is how do you redistribute that which was stolen legally. Okay? All right. Julie Henderson says, my last 15 years, I gave up vehicle expense and second job. I hear you, girl. I think I remember you telling us that story and how much you saved by not having to pay uh, to pay uh, insurance for your car uh, interest rate on a, on on the on the mortgage or lease of the car, etc. Good for you. All right, Michael Rennes says, Egberto, those at the top aren't working hard. They hardly work, and yeah, they. You know, here's the deal, and I need to uh, stop pretty soon because I have a fairly solid interview that I need to play. But the people, a lot of people at the top, says, I am smart. Even like like uh, Trump said, I pay. I I'm smart because I don't pay taxes. In other words. I am smart because I let all you do everything and I just, because I am Trump, I exist to take, right? You're right. The wealthy don't do much and they take a lot out of the economy because they use more resources than the individual person, but yet they want to pay on in the aggregate less. When you hear somebody says, my money, I let my money work for me. What it means is I let somebody else work and earn that money and I skim it and that's my money working for me. Remember that. If all of us have a tendency sometimes, we make our money work for us with interest and that kind of stuff. But the kind of money we're talking about when these guys say their money works for them, it is all of us who are working. And when they say their money is working for them, they mean we are working for them. Uh, we have Mike Cisak says, Venezuela has high inflation due to socialist policies. No, they have high inflation due to many policies, including the policies of the United States to, to sanction them, including uh, a deteriorating oil sector that was purposely incited on doing that. Look, there's no, look, 
Maduro is a clown. All right, Maduro is a clown. Chavez is not. Chavez is misguided in certain areas, but his heart was in the right place because of what the pilfering by the plutocracy had accomplished. So please, don't use Venezuela as an example. Use, Northern, use uh, Scandinavian Europe as an example of what we are talking about. Egberto, we haven't lost an aircraft to air-to-air dogfight since the Korean War. Love to hear that. Now again, remember, B-52s, if you, if you lay in a ton of B-52s to drop a whole bunch of bombs or something, uh, we may not lose any of our planes in an air-to-air fight, but we sure as hell can lose a B-52 because it just doesn't have what it takes, both in technology, because of its maneuverability and all of that, it just doesn't have it. I'm sorry, it just doesn't have it. A B-2 can fly at, a B-1 can fly at supersonic speeds. A B-2, while it can't, is made in a stealth manner that is able to get away from a whole lot of different missiles, etc., etc., etc. Yvette Avery Herod, welcome aboard, my dear beautiful lady. Uh, what else we got here? Michael says, Egberto, we haven't lost it. I read that one already. Uh, para ver, para ver, para ver, para ver. Uh, get well sooner. Yes, Michael, get well soon. Egberto's talking the use of things money wise. This is the point. I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, monoclonal antibodies, that's what it's called. Thank you, Bennett Bird Smith, for reminding me what the actual thing is. Uh, Paul Fleming says, new bill introduced in Texas would prevent polling places from being on college campuses. Republicans don't like 18 to 25-year-old voters. I mean, the, 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 it is so outright the way they want to stop people from voting, right? And then they, be, then they claim they believe in democracy. Come on, people. You don't buy that crap, do you? Uh, Paul Fleming says, new bill introduced. I read that one already. Uh, let's see. Julie Henderson says, Social Security must keep up with inflation. It does. Actually, it does. Uh, this year, I think there's like an 8 point something or 9% increase in, in, in everybody's wage who's on Social Security. Tom C. says, Senator Sir John uh, Federman checked into the hospital for clinical depression. What happens if he has to resign for mental and physical health reasons? I think the governor appoints a new uh, senator. And guess what? We have a Democratic governor. So I, we are okay for Pennsylvania. Lee Grant, how will you assess hard assets? Invade people's house to inventory their belongings? No, it has to be reported because you have to pay taxes on it, right? Now, don't you have your, your home assessed for income for property taxes? Yes, we do. And I have to pay it every year or I lose my home. So should the rich. Uh, okay, a lot of messages here. I got to go to the... I got to go to the... Um, Maduro is following Chavez policy. That's a lie. I think you should read... You should do a little bit more reading. If you believe that, you've, you've, you've s- sadly uh, forget to keep on reading, my dear friend. Uh, let's see what else we got here. Egberto and Bridge, Danielle Moody starts at 11.29, her epic takedown. Thank you very much for that one because I'll probably turn that into a blog. You're a good guy, E2247. Okay, money equal power coupons with accumulation is inherently corrosive to democracy. Thank you for that. Uh, w word thoughts. I love the way you spell that. Love the way you spell that. Julie Henderson says, Egberto, 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 8% inflation and 8% social security, zero increase. Actually, I misunderstood what you're saying. You're saying you want an increase north of inflation. And I think what you heard me say, if we follow what Bernie Sanders want to do, Bernie Sanders is trying to create an, an excise tax on a wealth, etc., so that we can have an increase above and beyond inflation in Social Security. So yes, Social Security is indexed to inflation, but it's too low at, at, at the current state. You're, current, you're absolutely right, Julie Henderson. All right, let's go to the, uh, the, the video that, that I have today, the interview that I did today. Uh, of course, uh, you know, as, as usual... When I'm about to start these things, I realize, oh, I was so strapped trying to get this stuff together that I forgot to link the video. But here we go. And I think you are going to see it right. Uh, Right as in, where is my video? I can't find my video. Bear with me, folks. But I'm coming with my video. And here is the video. Welcome to one more edition of Politics Done Right. Today we have, we are honored to have Michael Hayes. Michael Hayes has reported 
on the policies and practices of police departments in America, covered major criminal trials across the country, including the death penalty cases of Boston bomber Zohar uh, Zarni, I'd never say that right, and Charleston church uh, shooter Dilan Roof, and written about everything from mass shootings to presidential elections. In 2019, he was named a finalist for the prestigious Livingston Award for Young Journalists and Deadline Club Award for his investigative reporting on the New York PD's secret disciplinary files. Michael work has appeared in a wide range of outlets, including ProPublica, BuzzFeed News, Huffington Post, The Appeal, Gotham Mess, CNN, and WNYC. Michael grew up in New England and went to college at Fordham University, same where my, my nephew, in Bronx, New York. He lives in New Jersey and his wife, Ran, and their two sons, Lev and Elliot. Mike Hayes, welcome to Politics Center. How are you doing today, my friend? I'm doing well. Thanks for that great introduction. That was great. Well, it's warranted, man. You you cover some some tough subjects, and and, and this one here, I think, is especially um, poignant. So um, let me just start right up front. Why did you write the book? So I spent uh, about the past five years digging into the NYPD's uh, disciplinary system. First got involved with it uh, back in 2017, uh, working as a reporter at BuzzFeed. Uh, I was passed about 2,000 secret disciplinary files from a source. And myself and another reporter spent a year and a half, roughly, uh, reporting on uh, those files and just found tons of egregious stuff in there, uh, brutality, lying, uh, you name it. And uh, when the opportunity uh, to do the book came around... And um, beforehand, let me interrupt a second, because I did a bad thing in not saying, hey, Michael, what's the name of your book? (laughs) Yeah, good point, good point. Yeah, so the book is titled The Secret Files, Bill de Blasio, the NYPD, and the Broken Promises of Police Reform. And um, uh, just to give you give you the the thirty thousand foot elevator uh, pitch on the book. After Eric Garner was killed in July 2014, police accountability in New York City really became the issue for the De Blasio administration, and it's happened in no small part because. Mayor de Blasio himself said that they would use this tragedy to transform the NYPD into a police department that was more transparent and accountable to New Yorkers. Uh, As I was uh, getting to before, I focused primarily on what became the major fight over police reform in NYC during these years, how to reform and improve the NYPD's disciplinary process uh, and how the department policed its own. And what I found in the book is that because of politics and the awesome power of the NYPD, the city fell short and continues to do so when holding police who commit egregious misconduct accountable. Now, let me let me ask you this, because it it behooves me. First of all, do you think uh, then Mayor de Blasio was honest when he said he wanted to reform the police department? You know, I, I I think he I think he did set out with that uh, idea in his mind, and it's it's uh, uh, it's important I think that we we give him a little bit of credit. Uh, he did fulfill one of his major, arguably the biggest campaign promise he made when he was running for mayor in 2012. He was going to reform the NYPD's stop and frisk policy, and. Uh, after only a few weeks in office, he did a really important thing, which was drop the city's appeal of the the lawsuit over the NYPD's use of stop and frisk, which allowed the, the reforms uh, to go forward. So that was a really big deal and, and a really uh, big promise that he made during the campaign that he got done really quickly. However, fast forward seven months later, after after that, this is his first year in office, Eric Garner is killed. And uh, af- from, from that point on, uh, uh, the public safety issue and the, the mayor's administration was nothing but an uphill battle, nothing but challenges for the next eight years. Now, you've seen, uh, like I said, you went through a whole lot of files and you were able to see that 
there was no real decline in misconduct in police officers. In fact, you found that, uh, you know, they lie a hell of a lot. And the truth of the matter is, if you have a lying force, uh, stop and stop and frisk doesn't really have any teeth, right? Because they could be still stopping and frisking and lying, which case there's no stop and frisk, right? Yeah, well, that's that's interesting. You, you know, uh, specifically on stop and frisk and lying, uh, when you bring that up, it, it, it makes me think about the reforms that happened after the de Blasio administration dropped that lawsuit. Uh, basically, what happened was it allowed um, the city to start monitoring how the NYPD did stop and frisk. And uh, that's that monitor ship or monitoring process has been going on for uh eight plus years at this point maybe maybe even longer <laughs> uh sorry to try to do math uh on the air but it's been going on for a while and uh they regularly find it in the reports that they release on how the nypd continues to conduct stop and frisk that um there's a lot of shady stopping and frisking still happening right. a lot of unjustified and, and and a lot of uh you know when 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 it's being scrutinized by this outside body. Um, they they find that officers still don't quite understand how they're supposed to use that tool. Um, so, and and I just more broadly want to say one of the reasons I've focused so much on the line issue when it comes to police discipline and NYPD is uh, one thing we found very early on uh, when I was a reporter at BuzzFeed uh, doing our investigation. Um, if you look in the NYPD handbook, the NYPD patrol guide, it's called, it's like the Bible of the mm-hmm. NYPD. Um, there's a section in there that, uh, says if you, if you're caught lying, you're fired. It's very, it's a very black and white. It, it's one of the more, it, it, it's arguably more clear, uh, how they say they want to approach lying and handle lying than it is use of force. It's, and, and, and so, because that that policy existed, um, I found it very interesting and still find it interesting that you find so many incidents where police officers are untruthful, everything from lying in court to just uh, false police documents, um, which uh, lead to people spending time in jail that they should Now, have. you talk about false police documents. Is there any police document that isn't really false? I mean, I, I, you know, and I, I don't say that to be to be hurtful to police officers. I don't say that to demean police officers. But every time I've seen any report come under scrutiny from a police, it has never matched reality. I mean, it, we, we just had the five police officers who murdered that guy in in, uh, in Tennessee. And uh, even on video. As they are, as they are talking what the events are occurring, the video does not match what they're saying. So it's almost like they have the art of lying, in which case, how can you ever believe anything that comes out of any police officer's mouth, irrespective of locale? Yeah, uh, uh, glad you brought that up because I, I have been thinking a lot about this, uh, since the Tyree Nichols story came out and and i was wasn't shocked when i when i Mm -hmm. heard when it was reported that that initial police report um uh was misleading uh or or um uh didn't include certain information i write about uh several police killings that happened by the nypd over the last decade in my book and in every uh case uh this occurred where the initial information that was not just put out uh, in the police report, but uh, put out by the police department to the media uh, was um, at the best unclear and at worst just false. And um, uh, not to take anything away from the Tyree Nichols case, but um, uh, if you compare it to some of the cases I write about in the book, um, hit the, the information about the police report in the Nichols case being, being wrong came out rather quickly. But if you look at some of these examples in the book, Eric Garner is probably the most famous. Uh, that initial report that was put out the night of the, that he was killed in 2014 made no mention of the chokehold. And you can still find articles from like the New York Times online, the, just the, the initial kind of, five paragraph, seven paragraph news report on that 
where it's very vanilla, just a, a person was died uh, in, in an officer involved incident, something like that. Um, other cases in the book uh, that um, uh, uh, still shock me, um, the Marley Graham case, where actually uh, this month is the 11th anniversary of his death. Um, uh, the initial information put out by the police there that was covered by the media was that um, Marley Graham struggled with the officer who, who shot and killed him. This was uh, Romarley Graham. This was an 18 year old who police kicked down his door and uh, shot him in his bathroom in the Bronx uh, in front of his six year old brother and, and grandmother. And they initially said that he struggled with the officer. And actually three days after that, uh, uh, the police commissioner at the time of the NYPD, Ray, Kill Ray Kelly came out and, and walk that back. However, something interesting that I found while I was researching this case now, 10 years later, um, even despite that uh, admission from the police commissioner, three days after that happened, about a month later, a second police report was filed in the Romarley Graham case. And it still was saying that uh, he struggled with the officer who shot him. Um, which is really, I mean, that to me is is a really extreme example. You have a, a false report and, and an admission from the, the, the top brass at the NYPD. And yet a month later, they're still filing false information. And, and I, I'll end this story by saying nobody was ever investigated here in the Marley Graham case and, and or disciplined over that false reporting. It, it almost seems like the civilian leaders are always scared to confront the police and the union, even as they're the ones who define the budget for the police. You know, what power is it that you believe these unions? And I know you did this specific to New York, but I know in your investigations, you have bound to have gone over many other uh, cities and municipalities as well. What power is it that allows these uh, these these elected officials to almost give police the carte blanche on whatever they want, a carte blanche on allowing them to lie, allowing them to uh, mistreat, harm. What what is it that that um, that that they pull on these elected officials? Yeah, they. Um, uh, so uh, just to piggyback a little bit on what you're saying, the unions are awesomely powerful. They're very litigious. They spend a lot of money. Uh, a lot of their their union dues go to um, assembling a a army of, of lawyers to to um, defend police officers and do the union's work. They're also incredibly active in in lobbying and and that sort of thing. And and one interesting point that I think you're alluding to here about um, you know the dynamic between, say, uh, a Mayor De Blasio and a a uh, a Pat Lynch, the 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 head of the the uh, Patrolmen's uh, union. union in New York City. Uh, there's obviously great tension there. They they bash each other in the media all the time. Uh, the union side probably more so than the than the uh, administration side. But at the end of the day, they have to sit down at the table and hash out a contract. And um, so th that's an interesting tension that exists. And I, I, I will say um, um, one thing because I was uh, in, in, one thing that was intriguing to me to learn um, while researching this book was from my my perception, just from up to up to the point of of, of starting the book um, was you know that the unions just bash Bill De Blasio in the media, just hammer him constantly. Um, but if you dig deeper into what went on, um, on the contract side, he really, uh, um, you know, he, he was real, really skilled at negotiating their contract as well as all the other union contracts in the city. I think within his first few years in, in office, Mayor de Blasio renegotiated or negotiated every single union contract in the city. We're talking about 150, three contracts, I believe. Um, so that's no small, uh, yeah. job to do. And, and I think, um, uh, the, the PBA contract was the last one he got done, but he did get it done despite, uh, you know, Pat Lynch's, um, best efforts to delay and, 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 and kind of squeeze more and more out of him. Um, so that's just a really interesting tension that exists here.
Now, look, as an expert, and I do consider you somebody who went through all that material uh, to look at police misconduct, et cetera, and, and how powerful unions are and the threats they can make onto um, politicians. I have something to posit to you, and you tell me your thoughts about this. My 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 theory is that these politicians are scared to mess with police officers because if they go on a silent strike, if they go, uh, if they, if they let up on, on, on their, some of their heavy handedness, their fear is that there's going to be an explosion in violence and people being attacked. And then politically they're toast. But my, my, my answer to that is to play hardball. You guys are going to do this or we will invoke the national guard not we don't have a, a posse comitatus issue here because it would be the national guard and not specifically the military why don't we ever have politicians with spine to really break just like reagan broke patco why don't these guys who know the police officer unions are an institution of built on lies why don't they play the hard ball and let america see that we are there to defend you all yeah, no, the, 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 the fear factor that you bring up here is really interesting. And I think that was something that a lot of folks in and around the de Blasio administration during the time, during his tenure as mayor, talked to me about um, uh, one specific example. Most, uh, the most probably uh, stark example here is, um, you know, after Eric Garner was killed, uh, uh, the tension uh, between Mayor de Blasio and the NYPD, it, it, it really, um, st- things started to shift, but it really reached a boiling point later that year after two officers were gunned down in Brooklyn, uh, which led to, uh, the NYPD, NYPD members, um, and union members turning their back on the mayor and, and also led to a work, uh, slowdown. Um, um, one interesting side note after that work slowdown occurred, uh, some, uh, reporters dug into the data and they found that crime actually went down after the <laughs> NYPD slowed down. So, um, but, uh, the, the, you know, just to go back to your question, um, heard, I, I talked to a lot of people who, who told me that, um, the administration, the de Blasio administration was, was pretty scared, uh, of what might happen next there, um, after the officers, Turned their backs on him and, and were, you know, really just putting out this us versus them, um, mentality, this attitude, um, what might happen if there's, you know, 36,000, uh, NYPD patrol officers just decide to stop working. So, um, and to hear that, <laughs> to hear that from, from, uh, people who are working in, in and around the administration, uh, to me, it sounds like they weren't anywhere close to, uh, uh, your suggestion there of like, uh, really putting the screws to them. I think they were, uh, I, more in the same fear. Yeah. You know, I think, I mean, right now, I think police officers think they're gods and with their unions. And I think that they believe that they have these puny politicians at their behest. And until we say, no, we have other structures to prevent. I mean, we have the separation of powers everywhere else. Why don't we have it where these guys have? You know, I mean, here in Houston, where I'm at, uh, the police officers do no, no work that's more dangerous than a fire person. My father was a fireman. I think they're just, I mean, they, they save lives. They put themselves in danger. I would posit that you might find more firemen getting hurt than police officers getting hurt. And at the same time in, in Houston, they raised hell that there was an equalization of pay between police officers and firemen. And it, it on far people, I should say, it drove me crazy. But again, they have clout. We need to find a way to tell them, no, you don't. We pay your bills. And if you decide to go on strike, we go ahead and we bring in the National Guard. The National Guard works on command. You work on a little less than on command. Yeah, that's a really interesting uh, example uh, about a, a a fight in Houston. I, I I'm not familiar with that, but that's uh, I'd like to know more about that. Um, one thing I'll say here on um, uh, in terms of the union power, uh, if you're looking for a story uh, of hope, a story that maybe it could go another way, I'd uh-huh. point you toward I'd point you towards towards my book. Uh, uh, I think there's a 
a, re, uh, a story of hope here. Uh, specifically, what I'm referring to is so I, in, in the book, I talk a lot about this police secrecy law mm-hmm. in New York City. Thank Civil you, 50A. Right. Yeah, 50 Civil Rights Law 50A. So um, that was the law that kept police uh, disciplinary records secret uh, going all the way back to the 1970s. And, and it was repealed uh, in 2020 after George Floyd was killed. And, and a lot of people um, uh, will say shorthand, it, it, it happened overnight. Um, but uh, in, in my book, I talk about uh, the long, hard fought struggle of the uh, activist community in New York City, which is uh, largely led by the mothers and, and other loved ones of young black and brown men uh, who were killed by the NYPD over the years. Uh, their fight to get that law changed that dates back to, you know, the mid uh, 2010s, even earlier. And, and um, uh, these are, uh, this is a group of people that uh, to, to this day remains incredibly organized and just, uh, you know, has the, the, the fortitude and the drive to really do what, you know, tends to happen in our democracy. Things move slowly, but you have to be, uh, always in the game and and ready and wait for your moment. And, and part of why that, that law was changed so quickly in 2020 was, um, the activists who were, who were, who were driving that effort. Um, they were ready, uh, they were ready to, to push it and, and reorganize as soon as it looked like the state legislature, uh, had an interest in doing that. So that's, and, and, and for that, you know, that, that's a law that was written in the 1970s mm-hmm. by the police unions and was pushed successfully 40 years, keeping it intact in the legislature and, and also winning challenge after challenge in the courts. You know, that law was, was airtight. There would have been no way to reform it. It was either repeal or 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 nothing because of how much and successful case law there was, um, and all of that was very much police union driven. And and they went down. And then and when they after it it was repealed, they fought um, in the courts, and 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 the courts upheld the repeal as well. So, like I said, if this if that's something you're looking for, a story where the police unions lose. Uh, uh, I would point you to this book. That is excellent. Let, let, let me ask you one other thing, Mike. I mean, I imagine that uh, I imagine that those people, those activists that are fighting are are probably impressed with your book that actually, you know, activists as an active, what I call myself, an activist journalist myself. Uh, yeah, we, we, we get a whole lot. We, we do a whole lot, the activist part, but the research part is so very important so that you can apply the, the technical numbers to what's occurring. And I imagine that uh, they're happy for all that information that over the last several years you've been, been able to dig out. Yeah. Well, um, you know, I, I hope they, they like the book, but I, I think they're, they're, they're uh, 10 times happier with um, the way that that issue became a focus. Um, police secrecy and, and disciplinary secrecy became a real focus for reporters like myself after Eric Garner was killed and, you know, talk to uh, a lot of these folks that spend time up on the Hill in Albany. And, and they talked to me about how, you know, after our reporting at BuzzFeed came out, uh, reporting from the daily news that was going on at the same time, New York times as well. Uh, that really opened doors for them to uh, open new doors for them within the, state legislature just to get in there and, you know, explain what was going on with this issue. So yeah, uh, I know that that has been useful to that community. Well, let me, let me tell you here, uh, Mike, last question is one that's all on you. What would you have liked me to ask you that I didn't? Oh my gosh. Uh, I know everybody reacts that way. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I'll tell you, um, uh, I guess one, um, uh, one, one more quick anecdote from the book, uh, that's top of mind right now. Cause we've been talking about police unions so much. And I think it really speaks to, um, their willingness to do whatever it takes to defend mm-hmm. themselves. And I'll say it, this is a story about, uh, Pat Lynch, uh, the PBA president, um, who, who everybody I talked to for the book in and around uh, 
Mr. Lynch in and around the, the NYPD top officials refers to him as Patty in a very, uh, loving way. Uh, Friendly term, loving way, yeah. Um, which you, you know, uh, uh, as an Irishman who know, has a couple patties in his uh, family and extended family, I can, I, I get it. Um, uh, they they like his doggedness. And uh, one thing, what story about my um, uh, dealings with him? So uh, when we were getting ready to publish uh, our. Um, cache of records at BuzzFeed. We let the police unions know what we were going to do, um, gave them a ton of time uh, to respond. And what um, Pat Lynch did is he wrote a letter to the NYPD commissioner asking him to investigate uh, uh, whether myself um, and anyone inside the NYPD stole the, these documents. And, wow. And I only know about this letter uh, because they published it on their website like it was a press release um uh and it came out a couple days before um uh we published our database and that has always really stuck with me you know uh pat lynch he you know he's uh he's a union president you know him mostly from tv wearing you know a a a suit and but at the end of the day he's still a police officer right and and a police officer if they're gonna accuse somebody of a crime um they're supposed to find probable cause um or and and um you know i just found it interesting that as somebody who's in a profession where they they that level they're supposed to have that level of care and concern for what they're doing would 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 come out and and basically effectively accuse me of, of committing a crime um uh, with no real basis for that. Amazing. Michael Hayes, author of The Secret Files, Bill de Blasio, The New York and NYPD and the Broken Promises of Police Reform. Thank you so kindly for having been on Politics Done Right. That's some very important work that you wrote here that everybody needs to take a look at. Thanks for having me. That was great. I really enjoyed that interview. I, I think the book is dropping on the 21st of February. I'll put all the link information when I get the, uh, when I put the blog up for the interview. Michael Rudnan asked me to put something on the screen. It's actually a, a Twitter thread that Michael Hayes, the guy that just, uh, uh, we just interviewed had on. So check that out right there. It gets you on, on, put that on, let you hear that. My sister lives in, in Maine and thought, and fought for SSDI rather than SSS. SSDI pays more. What is SSDI? Um, I don't know what that is. What is SSDI? Social Security. Oh, Social Security Disability Income. Got you. Got you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, wow. Okay. Uh, let's see what else we got. What else we got? Don't you have to be under the retirement age for that? Or anyway, I will leave that up to to uh, to the discussion that Bridge is already commanding on. Egberto E2247 gets the credit for finding that Twitter. Oh, I'm sorry. I I thought I said that. But if I didn't, E2247 found this thread and Michael Rudden suggested we put it on the screen. That's why I did. And the thread is about uh, describing an incident where a police officer in New York just came across and hit the protester with batons like there was no mercy. Like there should, there shouldn't have had to be that because he had no right to do what he did, but he did. Anyhow, um, the next subject that I want to talk about today, and, and great watching that conversation that all of you are having in the chat. That's why I love this group. You guys really get busy in that chat. And folks, if you want to be a member of the part of the chat, just go on in to find us actually on our page, uh, the Facebook page or, or the, the chat within the YouTube page, whichever one you want. But anyhow, the second subject that I wanted to talk about, and I hope I brought, I hope I kept it up. Let me put the other thing on the screen before I get there. It's going to be a quick, 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 quick read, but I want to read it to you because you know there was a time that you'd always hear Republicans talk when they're talking about policies that help people. They would always talk about, um, you know, going to uh, granny, throwing the granny over the the hill, or you know, or, or something you're doing to granny or whatever. Uh, but I brought up another topic that I wanted to discuss where a friend of mine, he's, he's a Texas guy, uh, 
come on, why can't I find it now? I want to find Granny. There we go. Title of the, the title of this article by our good friend, Jim Hightower, the activist here in Texas, says, yes, Wall Street would like to kill your granny for a few bucks. Some 70% of nursing homes are now corporate operations. So let me read the article real quickly because it's a short article that our brother wrote, but I think it, that everyone needs to understand this. It goes like this on Common Dreams. There are industries that occasionally do something rotten. And there are industries like big oil, big pharma, and big tobacco that persistently do rotten things. Then there is the increase in the nursing home industry where rottenness has become a core business principle. I would call it a core business model. The end of life experience can be rotten enough on its own with an assortment of natural indignities bedeviling us. And good nursing homes help gentle this time. In the past couple of decades, though, an entirely a unnatural force has come to dominate the delivery of aged care, profiteering corporate chains uh, and Wall Street speculators. And the, way, the reason they see money in that is, guess what? Social Security pays people. They say, we'll take all your Social Security money. And since there are going to be so many retirements from the big boomer, the baby boomers, we're going to take them all in, lock them into a nursing home, take all their money, and give them the minimal service that that the economy of scales allow us, given what we have, given the mass amount of people in nursing homes. Now, economy of scales means we can do it efficiently and then skim off a hell of a lot of profits and we screw you in the process. Here continues Brother Jim Towers' article. The very fact that this essential and sensitive social function, which ought to be the domain of health professionals and charitable enterprises, is now called an industry reflects a total perversion of its purpose. Some 70% of nursing homes are now corporate operations run by absentee executives who have no experience in nursing homes and who were guided by the market imperative of maximizing investor profits. They constantly demand by the, they constantly demand efficiencies from their facilities, which invariably means reducing the number of nurses, which invariably reduces care, which means more injuries, illnesses, and deaths. As one nursing expert rightly says, it's criminal. But it's not against the law. Since the industry lobby in front, a major donor to congressional campaigns effectively writes the laws which allows corporate hustlers to provide only one nurse on duty, no matter how many patients are in the facility. When a humane nurse staffing requirement was proposed last year, the lobby group furiously opposed it, and Congress dutifully bowed to industry profits over grandma's decent end time. After all, granny doesn't make campaign donations. So, as health policy analyst bluntly puts it, the only kind of groups that seem to be interested in investing in nursing homes are bad actors. Don't forget that. This is what a system that puts healthcare in a for-profit domain gives you. This is what an inhumane economic system predicated solely on profits gives you. When we learn, when we learn that there's nothing democratic about the structure of the way our capitalist structure operates, we will start putting in the true regulations, we will start putting in the true breaks, and we will start really allowing free enterprise to flourish in such a manner that those greedy, those greedy folks who controls, control our economy can no longer do the evil, inhumane, selfish deeds upon people in their latter years. It's amazing. They just can't find enough people to hurt. Folks, uh, we are at the end of the show. I trust that you enjoyed what we gave today. I want to ask all of you, because I constantly forget to do it in time, to provide the program support as best you can. If you have the wherewithal to give Politics Done Right a coffee a month, two coffees a month, or whatever you can, one coffee ever, please consider supporting us by going to politicsdoneright.com 
slash PayPal, politicsandright.com slash PayPal. Alternatively, uh, you can support us on Patreon. We need a whole lot more patrons. So I ask you so kindly, if you have the wherewithal, please become one of our patrons. That's at politicsandright.com slash Patreon. Patreon is spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N. Politicsandright.com slash Patreon. You can also sign up at our YouTube. If you're on YouTube, just click the join button. Become a part of our YouTube posse. Uh, it, it, you know, again, a coffee a month or something like that, I think it would be very helpful to keep us doing what we're doing. If you're not on YouTube, you can go to politicsandright.com slash YouTube, which is another form of get into the same place. Support us by buying our books. Our books can be gotten at politicsandright.com slash books. And you can shop at our store for our t-shirts and our hats, etc. at politicsandright.com slash stores. We just can't do this without you. Check out my new book. Uh, my new book is uh, currently just uh, a chapter at a time that, that's on, on Amazon. You can go to politicsandright.com slash tribulations, politicsandright.com slash tribulations. And again, all the different forms that you can find to support us can be found in at one link, politicsandright.com slash support, politicsandright.com slash support. Thank you so kindly for having spent this time with me. I trust that you enjoyed the program. I trust that we learned together in this program. And I trust that we'll keep doing this to make this a better country. Don't, 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 don't believe those who think things are just going to remain the way they are. We can make a difference. My name is Egberto Willis. This is Politics and Right. And you guys know how I end this baby. I am what? We spend a lot of time deconstructing the news, trying to, trying to parse it into a form that everybody can understand. We try to find those little nitpicks where uh, it goes, it flies above the fray, etc. If you really like these videos that we do, I want to ask a big favor. Please go ahead, number one, subscribe to our channel, and number two, please join if you can. Thank you so kindly for watching. Keep watching. Please remember to share. We must populate the entire internet with our progressive message, a message that we know is what most Americans say that they want. So help us please join.